If you have your Bible, please open it up to Mark chapter 10. We're going to begin our study there in just a moment. Thank you for being here. I know we have a number of visitors, and we are so honored that you are here with us, and I'm so thankful for all the members that are here with us. I appreciate your faithfulness. What an encouragement to be able to gather together as the people of God and to be uh, encouraged to be reminded of our great Father in heaven and our Savior Jesus Christ. It is indeed well with our souls. And it is well with our soul. We studied from the book of Hebrews, and we have been reminded about our great high priest. And while it wasn't in the class in Thessalonians, I'm sure you were encouraged by the things that you studied today, remembering who we are as the people of God. And so what a great blessing it is to be God's people. Maybe there's someone here this morning who is considering becoming a Christian. We'd love to study God's word with you. If you have any Bible questions, please let us know. And so it's a great blessing as well. Uh, I try not to embarrass people, but it's a great blessing as well to have Miss Angelique here with us, and uh, Sister Jade and Sister Angelique, uh, our two new sisters in Christ, and our, our brother in Christ, Cameron, with us as well. So let's encourage our, our new family that we have, and uh, let's, uh, it's just a blessing to see them with us today. I want to take you back to the days of Jesus just for a few minutes, and I want you to imagine for a moment that you've had the opportunity to, to listen to this man named Jesus. You have heard about his miracles you have even seen his miracles you get an opportunity to talk to him a one-on-one conversation how amazing would that be if you had a one-on-one conversation with Jesus when that opportunity arises what would you want to talk to him about would you have a question that you would want to ask him it's a one-on-one conversation all right so you get this opportunity what would you want to ask Jesus, the one who performs these great miracles, the one who is the master teacher, the one who is sinless. We find an example of this in Mark chapter 10. We read about a man who had this opportunity. He had this, uh, this opportunity, this one-on-one session, if you want to describe it like that, where he was able to talk to Jesus. He was able to ask Jesus a question. From the question that we see that this man asked, we learn a lot about him. In Mark chapter 10, I'm referring to the story that we read about, beginning in verse number 17. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. I think that's how we would respond as well, right? You get an opportunity to stand before Jesus. You're going to run up to that, run up to him, take that opportunity, kneel before him. This man ran up to him, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, you got to give this man credit, right? Because think about the question that he's asking. He's not asking some trivial question here. He's going to Jesus, and you've got to give him some credit for knowing that Jesus is the one that can help answer this question for me. What must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? You find this uh, passage also in Matthew chapter 19 and Luke chapter 18 as well. And so he goes before Jesus, and he says, good teacher... What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Then Jesus responds in a maybe a, an interesting way, at least for some of us. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So it's interesting how Jesus responds to this man. Why did he respond in that manner? A couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, he was not saying, Jesus was not saying that he is not good or that he had some type of sin and he's not saying that he was not deity we know that he is rather it becomes very fascinating to see that Jesus was really helping this man that came before him this man who is described as a ruler this man who is described as being young this man who is being described as we'll see later on who had many possessions he's helping him to see if this man really believed Jesus to be good then it also followed that he believed Jesus to be God. And if Jesus was God, it followed that any answer he would give to him would be authoritative in nature. And so I think Jesus was just trying to help this man to see, why are you calling me good? Do you understand the significance of what you're saying? So he asked him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Look how Jesus responded in verse 19. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So he begins to go through some of those commandments given to the Israelites. Now I love the response here. He said to him, the man said to him, 
Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. That's impressive. It's a good reminder, I think, too, that young people can, can do the will of God. You can keep the commands of God. This young man said, here, listen, I have been doing this. I have been keeping God's commandments since I was a youth. Now watch what happens next. You go back to the text in verse number nine, or verse 21, looking at him, and I love this here. Jesus felt a love for him. He loved this man. And while this man was right in many areas, there was a problem that this man had. And yet Jesus, he loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Now, what should have been the response from this young man? Thank you. This is what I've been looking for. I want eternal life. Remember, that's what he said. What do I have to do? What good thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So the one who to that he went to, the one who was God in the flesh, said, here's what you need to do. You're doing great, but you're lacking one thing. Go and sell all your possessions and come and follow me. But the response from the young man was not one of excitement. It was not one of, of being zealous. It was one of great disappointment. Look at what happens next. In verse 22, but as these words, he was saddened. In my margin, it says he became gloomy. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. It's a powerful story, and yet at the same time, it is a very sad story. A couple of interesting things that stick out to me when just looking at this text here. The commandments that Jesus said, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He was keeping those commandments that dealt with how he was to love his neighbors and how he was to interact with others. And yet, this man still had a major problem. Jesus went right to the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem was this man's heart. While he was looking for eternal life, he was not willing to make the necessary sacrifices that Jesus was helping him to see that he needed to make. And you could say that in one sense that the possessions that he had had really become his God. He was seeking to do the will of God, and yet his possessions were now getting in the way of the very words of God in the flesh. He wasn't willing to sell his property. He wasn't willing to do exactly what Jesus told him to do. He wasn't willing to do the very things that he was asking and looking for and trying to figure out. Certainly covetousness and trust, I think you could say, in his riches had now got in the way. While he wanted something great, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He got the answer, and yet he still walked away grieved and saddened. Now that's the interaction that this man had with Jesus. Now I want you to go back and I want you to think about if I had that opportunity or if you had that opportunity where you get to have a conversation with Jesus. Maybe you ask the same question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you go through the same conversation and, listen, I've been keeping the commandments, Lord. I've been, I've been doing the will of God. And Jesus stares at you, or he stares at me, and he says, there's one thing you lack. I think we all would be standing there in great anticipation. Tell me, please tell me. Maybe we wouldn't want to hear it because this man heard exactly what he was going after and he went away sad. How would we respond? When Jesus said, look, you can have this. You can have eternal life, but there's one thing you really lack. It's such a powerful story. Maybe riches are not going to get in our way when it comes to being with our Savior one day in heaven. Maybe riches will not hinder us. Maybe it's not the, the problem of covetousness, but it, could it be something else? It's interesting that when you think about our lives and you think about people in general, many people seek after the right things in life. Many people seek after having good health and many people seek to save for retirement and provide for their families adequately. And people can go to a variety of sources to find out how they should eat and how they should work out and how they should save and how they should plan and all of these different things. And yet, many people never really obtain the very thing that they so desperately desire. Why is that? Maybe you've experienced something like that before. Maybe you've seen someone else like that. 
Those desires are not necessarily where the problem exists, but rather it's what one knows and then what one actually will do. This man was seeking eternal life. He wanted eternal life, and this was something that was on his mind. It didn't appear to be any type of, type of trick question like the Pharisees had asked Jesus earlier in the context, and so he was now given what he needed to do, but that did not line up with what he was ready to do. He was not willing to take those difficult steps. And many times we see that maybe even in our own lives or in our world where when it comes to finances or fitness or relationships or a variety of other parameters, you name it, it can be very easy to dream big and to consider and to imagine how great something is going to be. But then when it really comes to counting the cost and really understanding just how difficult some of those steps may be to obtain it, that is where often the disconnect lies. Now, while we can talk about those issues, I want you to think about heaven for a moment. Think about heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Heaven is a real place. It is a place that God's people can be and will be one day. It's going to be an amazing place. Can't even put it into words. That's how amazing it's going to be. It's a place that you can really go to, that I can really go to. Is heaven really our goal? If it is, then know that we can go there. And I'll just, let me just read a couple of passages here. Look at Philippians chapter 1, and then we'll look at Philippians chapter 3. And there's so much that we could say here, but just the idea of being with our Father, being with our Savior for eternity, it's going to be awesome. And Philippians chapter 1, as Paul was writing to the saints in Philippi, he reminded them in verse 21, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, he said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be so great. It's going to be very much better. Paul said it's very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Later on in chapter 3, he reminded the saints about their citizenship where their citizenship really is, where our citizenship really is. In chapter 3 and verse number 20, he said, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior. That should be how we feel about Christ, his return, and being with him forever. That it's something that we are, something that we are so anxious about, that it's something that we are looking forward to, that we can't wait for it to happen. We are eagerly waiting for a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. What is that going to be like? And can you imagine just how awesome that really is going to be? Our bodies are going to be transformed into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even even to subject all things to himself. Heaven, my friend, is a place where we can go. It's a place where God wants us to be. We can indeed have eternal life. But I will say this, heaven can be our home one day. It doesn't have to be just a dream. But it will require that we take some difficult steps of our own. Jesus told this man, that rich young ruler, that he needed to take some difficult steps. And he wasn't willing to take those difficult steps. While he said he wanted eternal life, he wasn't willing to take the steps to follow Jesus, to truly walk with him. The question is going to be, what about us? If we, truly, uh, if we truly want to be with him, we're going to have to truly walk with him and take the steps that he requires of us, even when they become difficult in nature. That rich man failed to truly give his heart to Jesus. Heaven, my friend, can be our final destination. But as we're on this journey to eternity, as we all stand on the edge of eternity, make no mistake about it, there will be some difficult steps that we're going to have to take. And this morning, for a few minutes... I want to walk you through the Gospels, and I want you to see some of the difficult steps that we're going to have to take as we prepare our way or make our way to being with God one day in heaven. And I want you to do something else. I want you to know that as we think about some of these challenging steps that we're going to take, that these steps are taking us somewhere. We're not just kind of walking around in circles. We are on a path. We are on a destination. We are going somewhere. We need to truly believe that we are, that we can be where God is one day. But it is going to require some very challenging things for us at times. As we think about these steps, I want you to ask yourself, could this be the thing that may cause me 
to, to, to miss out? Or is this something that I am lacking or do I need to, to grow in this area? Am I willing to do what the good teacher requires me to do? There is so much that we could talk about, but I want to walk us through or walk in the, the Sermon on the Mount back in Matthew chapter 5. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking you could do the entire lesson here from Matthew chapter 5 because there are some challenging statements that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 5 as he began to teach the crowds. In Matthew chapter 5, I believe we see a very challenging, uh, some, a challenging path that we're all going to have to take. This is something that all of us are going to have to experience and endure. And as I read Matthew chapter 5, I begin to see that as we make our way to heaven, it's going to require that we take some difficult steps with respect to enduring persecution. That's what Jesus talked about. It's one of those unexpected blessings that we read about in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. He said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were also who were before you. I don't know about you, but when I read that, that's a ch those are some challenging verses. And the fact that he says, "Blessed are you when you're persecuted." I love it when I hear people say, "You ask them, you know, how are you doing today?" And they say, "Man, I'm doing well. I'm blessed." I love it when I hear people say things like that. That's good. But I don't know if I've really heard anyone say I'm blessed because I've been persecuted and I've been insulted for the cause of Christ. And maybe that's what's behind the reason why they're saying I'm blessed. I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. People also say things like that. But I wonder how many times people are saying that in the midst of persecution, when they're being insulted and persecuted for the cause of Christ. And yet Jesus said, listen, if you're going to be my disciple, you will be persecuted. You will have to take this, you're going to have to endure this, and this is going to be a part of your journey. Jesus endured intense persecution, and so we shouldn't really be surprised that as he endured persecution, we are going to have to take those same steps as well. In Acts chapter 5, we see just one example of many. In Acts chapter 5, we know that the apostles, they endured and had to take these steps of persecution as well, and they were insulted and persecuted for the cause of Christ, for the sake of Jesus. In Acts chapter 5 and verse number 40, uh, after they're about to be released or before they're going to be released, the Bible says in Acts 5 and verse 40, they took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. And what's so fascinating about this, they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing. That's exactly what Jesus said. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They went through it as well. And yet they responded in the right manner. But I will tell you at times, many times, these steps of persecution can be extremely challenging and difficult. And yet Jesus says this is something that you will experience. In Acts chapter 14, Paul he said the same thing as he went back to strengthen some of the saints. In Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse number 21 and verse number 22. Acts chapter 14, look at verse number 21 and 22. Notice what the Bible says here. After they had preached the gospel to that city, Paul and Barnabas, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. That's what we all need. We all need to be encouraged to continue in the faith and watch what they said next. And saying through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. They needed to be encouraged and they also needed to be reminded that they were going to go through some dark days. If Jesus experienced this, if the apostles experienced this, if this is some of the message that they were sharing with the saints to remain faithful to God, and oh, by the way, you're going to be taking a lot of steps of persecution as well then my friends, make no mistake about it, we are going to have to travel down the same path. However, as we think about these difficult steps, remember what Jesus said, it will be worth it. It will be worth it because we are on a, we are on a journey to get somewhere. We do have a reward waiting for us in heaven. And this is so important. In the world that we live in, as we navigate the cultural storms all around us, we should no longer be surprised when we are insulted for the cause of Christ. People should see that we are serving Christ. They should see a distinction in us. And we should not be surprised when 
when persecution comes our way. And I know it can come in a variety of ways. But we are going to face challenges as we strive to continue to remain faithful to God. Think about the young people who are going back to school. Young people can face persecution in school, and many times they do. It could be just with insults or ridicule. It could be from your college professors. It can come in a variety of ways. The same is true when it comes to our jobs. There's a lot of pressure put on Christians to try to conform to what everybody else is doing in the world. Whether it's with sexual immorality, you name the situation, you name the sin. There's a lot of pressure being put on us. But Jesus said, listen, blessed are you when you go through all of this for my name's sake. Make no mistake about it, you will have to go through this path or go on this path. You are going to have to take these steps of persecution. But he also tells us you will be rewarded for this. These are some difficult steps that not everybody is willing to take. We have to ask ourselves as Christians, as the people of God, are we willing to take these difficult steps as we make our way to heaven? These are not the only challenging steps that we're going to have to take, and maybe some of us are walking these steps right now, taking these steps at this very moment. I want to encourage you to remain faithful to God. I want to encourage you to remember that as we think about these steps of of persecution, we're also going to have to take some more challenging steps. As disciples of Jesus, Jesus tells us and he teaches us that as we make our way to heaven, we are going to have to deny ourselves. In Luke chapter 9, and there's other passages that we could look at in Luke chapter 9, he makes that very clear. And at times, this becomes really difficult of denying ourselves and putting him first. In Luke chapter 9 and verse number 23, Luke chapter 9 and verse number 23, the Bible says, Jesus was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Those words there can become very difficult, easy to read, but they can become really difficult when we have to start putting these into practice. Jesus is helping us to see that he... And all things are going to have to come. He's going to have to come first. We are going to have to deny ourselves and on a daily basis follow him. We're going to have to walk with him. And yet for many, these can be challenging steps to take. Jesus wouldn't stop here. Jesus would make it clear later on as he spoke to the crowds in Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, as he had a large audience. And what do you say to 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 a crowd that's following you, to a crowd that wants to hear what you have to say? Well, Jesus didn't sugarcoat anything about being his disciple and being with him one day. He said in Luke chapter 14 and verse 25, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, Now imagine if you were in this crowd. How would you feel when you heard these words? Listen to what he says here. If anyone comes to me, which means that we can, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot. Be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Those are challenging words. They're not not words that we just kind of quickly read and then say, all right, I hear what he says. Let's just move on. Jesus was challenging his audience. And as we look at these words here, while we don't have a face-to-face conversation with Jesus, We can hear exactly what he wants us to do. I want you to put me first. I want you to love me more than your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even your own life. That's where Jesus says he has to be. Brothers and sisters, that can become really difficult at times. I think about the rich young ruler The rich young ruler wanted heaven. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? I'll tell you what you need to do. You lack one thing. Sell all your possessions and come and follow me. And when he heard that, he went away grieved. And as I I think about this story here, I wonder, was this man going away grieved because he was thinking about, I wonder how this is going to impact my family if I do all this? 
How is this going to impact maybe some of his siblings if he just gives everything away? Or I wonder, was he thinking primarily more about himself? Maybe he had thoughts like, I have worked so hard for all of this. And now Jesus is saying, give it all away? Maybe he was thinking to himself, I was poor growing up, and there's no way I can go back to that previous situation. Maybe he was thinking to himself, people know who I am, and I don't want to lose my status that I currently have. He got the very answer that he needed, and yet he wasn't really ready to take up his cross and to follow Jesus. He wasn't ready to do what it was that Jesus wanted him to do. No doubt about it, selfishness, his interest came before God. It came before serving Jesus Christ. And when I think about this passage here, I often ask or I think to myself, you know, what is part of the, the most challenging aspect of verse 26? Hating your father and mother, your wife and children and brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. All of those are obviously important, and we, all, we need to make sure that we put Christ above everyone. But I often wonder where the biggest challenge may be. Could it be with our family? We love our families. I love my wife. I love my mom and my sister, my brother-in-law. We love our children. I think at times the biggest challenge is that last part of that verse. And even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And I think that's what really was getting in the way of this rich young ruler. He was focusing on what he ultimately wanted. This is what I want. And what Jesus said didn't match where, what he wanted to do. It didn't align with what he wanted. And Jesus said, you've got to put me first. I must be first in front of everything and everyone. I was thinking about that song, Glorify Your Name. Father, we love you, we worship you, and we adore you. Those are some powerful words. Do we love our Heavenly Father? Do we truly adore him and love him so much that we're going to do whatever he asks us to do? That's where we need to be. And yet this can be difficult. These can be very difficult steps. As we think about our journey, let's remember the words of Jesus. Jesus in the garden said, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the mentality that we have to have. We've been born again. We are alive now through Jesus Christ. And we don't live for ourselves. We live for him. We live to serve him and our heavenly father in heaven. And yet that's challenging. Because in the world, the world tells us through social media and platforms and movies and televisions and magazines, you be whatever you want to be, you do whatever you want to do. This idea of about authority, just kind of throw that to the side. Jesus says, I need for you to submit to me. I need for you to follow me, whatever the cost may be. Those can be some difficult steps that we're going to have to take. You must love me more than you love yourself. You must love me more than every aspect of your life, whether it's your marriage or your children or your finances or your brethren and even your own life. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Those are some difficult steps, but those are necessary steps. Those are steps that are required for us as we strive to make heaven our home. And as we think about those steps, when we love our Heavenly Father and Savior, when we are willing to follow Him, no matter the cost, no matter what may be, that's going to help us to take some other steps as well. It's going to help us to take steps of repentance. You see, that's what Jesus also talked about as well. And sometimes these steps can become extremely challenging. We're already in Luke. Let's just go back to chapter 13. Jesus made it very clear that repentance is not something that is optional. It is not something that is just to be said and, yeah, we need to think about it, but we really don't really really need to do it. He said, you have to do this. I have to do this. You have to do this. If we don't, we will perish. He said in chapter 13, verse 1, this conversation is taking place. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Salaam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all of the men who live in Israel or in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus says, this is what we must do. I preached a couple of weeks ago how repentance is an unpopular message, but it is the message of Jesus Christ. 
It was the message of John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 1, he began his ministry preaching uh, preaching repentance. In Mark chapter 1, let's just go back there real quickly here. Because I want you to see this, is, this has been the message throughout the New Testament. In Mark chapter 1. In verse number 4, as John the Baptist began his ministry, he appeared in the wilderness. And that's interesting just to think about that. There's more we can say. But he appeared in the wilderness. And I want you to notice what it says. Preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. After he's locked up and eventually died, Jesus continues to preach the same message, a, a message of repentance. In verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The apostles, they preached the same message in Mark chapter 6 when they were sent out. In Mark chapter 6 and verse number 12, they went out and preached that men should repent. These are steps that we're all going to have to take. This is a message that's not popular, but our Savior demands that people change. Our Savior demands that we change. I've sat across people at dinner tables and Bible studies in times past, and I'm sure you guys have done this as well, where people have been so excited about the gospel. When you tell people that that things can be well with their soul, that's what people are looking for, right? And you tell people about the hope that they can have in Jesus Christ, that they can be redeemed, all their sins can be washed away. That's what I want. But then when you start talking about repentance, hold on a second. Wait, time out. All that other stuff you said was really good. Well, yeah, you can have all of that. But you're also asking me to to change? And that's where often the line is drawn in the sand. I remember a couple in Vider, Texas. I was uh, uh, studying with them at the dinner table. They had been visiting for a number of weeks. Everything seemed to be going well. But you know how in Bible studies things just naturally kind of come up? When you start studying the scriptures and start hearing more about Jesus, and we got on the topic of of marriage and divorce. I think it has happened kind of naturally. And that's when the whole study changed. They were seeking after the right thing, kind of like that rich young ruler. But it's almost like Jesus was saying, you lack one thing. There's something that is amiss. There's something that needs to change. There's something that you must do. And at the time, they were not willing to do that. And those studies stopped. Now, maybe they have. I don't know. But what I've seen in times past, and this is not just for people that we sit with at the dinner table. I need to put the mirror up right now and look at myself. And that's what all of us must do as we think about these steps. These are steps that we all must take. Jesus makes that very clear. And yes, repentance will come with a price. Yes, it's going to be challenging. And it's not just something we do before we become a Christian. We need to have this heart of being willing to turn from our sins and continually turn to our God. When we understand that we have gone astray, we need to be willing to change. That's what we find all throughout the New Testament. I want you to think about uh, Peter in Galatians chapter 2. And I wonder at times how difficult this really had to be for Peter. Everybody knew Peter. He's one of the pillars. It's Peter that we're talking about. And yet what we find here is that this man, this apostle, he he was in need of repentance. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. It's just, it's just powerful to see. In verse 11, that it says he stood condemned. His soul indeed was in danger, and even for someone like the apostle Peter, repentance was necessary. But we've got to give Peter credit because we know that Peter certainly repented of his sins. And that says something about his heart. Yes, he made mistakes. And yes, when he recognized that he needed to change, that's exactly what he did. Brothers and sisters, repentance. These are steps that we're going to have to take. And it's not just like a one-time deal. Yes, we need to repent. And as we find things that we need to continue to change, we have to do that. In Revelation chapter 2, as uh, the the church in Ephesus is is given instruction in Revelation chapter 2, while they were doing many great things, The Bible says in verse number 4, Jesus said, But I have this against you, 
that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So what we find here is that Jesus is not playing any games. These are steps that all of us are going to have to take. And yes, they can be difficult at at times. But again, they're going to be worth it because there's so much at stake. Eternity. The rich man, he said, I want to inherit eternal life. Yet he wasn't willing to take those necessary steps. His heart was filled with covetousness and probably pride as well. And he wasn't willing to make the necessary changes to to follow Jesus and to sell all that he had. What about us? My friends, repentance. These are steps. This is a step that all of us are going to have to take. And As I think about these steps, steps of persecution, steps of denying self, steps of repentance, we need to keep in mind that as we go through all of this and think about our journey, that it's going to be critical that we make sure that we take steps of faith. It's hard sometimes hearing this, some of these ideas, and yet we have to trust and truly believe what Jesus says. This is exactly what he wants us to do, and this is exactly how we need to respond to him. And what this is going to require, it's going to require for us to take steps of faith. We have to trust our Savior. We have to fully believe in him and what he has to say, and yet I will tell you, steps of faith at times can be really challenging where we remain with our Savior, even during the difficult days. The apostles, they were struggling at times with their faith. In Mark 4, I talked about this last week in my sermon. In Mark 4, Jesus told them, we're going to the other side. It happened just as he said it would happen. Yet they struggled with their faith. The apostle Peter, he struggled in his faith. In Mark 4, though, I'm already here, so let's just read that. In verse 39, he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? That was a challenge for them throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ. What's interesting as well, go to the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. After Jesus was raised from the grave, I want you to notice in Mark chapter 16, verse number 14, Jesus still has to address this issue where there was still some doubting. They needed to to fully trust in him. In Mark 16 and verse 14, afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves, and as they were reclining at the table, and he he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. Oh, that's going to change. But he had to help them to see that they should have believed the very things that were said. They struggled from time to time, or maybe not time to time. They often struggled with respect to their faith. And as I think about the apostles, we can be just like them. We can struggle mightily at times in our faith. And yet we are required to walk and to take this journey with our Savior with steps of faith. The road that we take, the road that we're on, it will become cloudy and foggy. We are not always going to know exactly the path and the direction, but we know our final destination. We're going to have to remain with our Savior through it all. And so here's what this means. Here's what this looks like. We need to know that what Jesus says he means and that he's walking along with us and that he's going to give us the very things that we need. In Matthew chapter 6, as we look at our lives and as we think about our destination being with him one day in heaven, we're going to have to trust in him. Yeah, I know. We already know that. We have to trust in him. We don't have to worry, but we really need to believe what he says. When he says, do not worry, he's not just kind of saying that casually. He means it, do not worry. He emphasized that in Matthew 6 and verse number 25. Do not be worried in verse 27. And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life in verse 28? And why are you worried about clothing? Verse 31, do not worry then what we'll eat or what we'll drink or what we'll wear for clothing. And by the way, in verse 30, he said, Oh, you of little faith. Yeah, we can read these. They're so easy to read. But when, when life happens, when life hits, it gets tough. And yet he tells us, do not worry. These are the steps we're going to have to take, steps of faith. He will not only provide for our physical needs, but think about it. He's also going to provide for the necessary strength to endure all that we face. Jesus promises that one day he will return. He told his apostles that he was going away in John chapter 14, but one day he would return. 
And not only is he going to return, we're going to be with him. We're going to be caught up in the air to be with him forever, which means that we're going to have to trust what he says, that we can really go to heaven. That this is not just some, some dream or some fantasy. It will be our reality. Jesus has already gone before us, and therefore we can eagerly wait his return. But we have to truly trust what he says. As we think about our prayers, we need to take steps of faith, knowing that our Savior hears our prayers. We don't have to question and wonder and doubt. He wants us to pray to our Heavenly Father. And we can know that he indeed hears our prayers. Our brother Michael reminds, reminded us this morning of the fact that we can be confident that our sins have been forgiven. When Jesus says that our sins have been washed away, we need to have that confidence that our sins indeed have really been washed away. And we need to know that God cannot lie. He cannot lie. But I will tell you, in spite of this, I've talked to Christians. And I'm not saying I have it all put together because I don't. But I have talked to Christians who say, you know, I still struggle with this idea. Can I really go to heaven? Have you ever felt that way? Can I really go to heaven? Yeah, I've heard sermons and songs and things like that, but can I really be there one day? Me? Can I really be with God one day? Have I truly been forgiven? Does God really love me? We're going to have to trust what Jesus says and know he means exactly what he says which means that we don't stop walking with him. We keep going. And even when it's really hard to put one foot forward, we take those necessary steps and we finish the race. And as we think about these steps, yes, from time to time, or many times are gonna be difficult, but let me just encourage you with three final thoughts. First, remember that these steps will always be worth it. You go back to Mark chapter 10 where we began, you turn back there real quick, and Mark chapter 10, after this rich man walked away, Jesus had a conversation with his apostles. He said in Mark chapter 10 and verse 23, he looked around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter said, behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life you know what he's saying you need to stick with me keep walking with me because it will be worth it it's not for nothing secondly we need to know that others have gone before us paul said i have fought the good fight i finished i finished my course i've kept the faith i know there's a crown waiting for me one day if Paul could finish his race, and it wasn't easy, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But if he could finish his race, then brothers and sisters, we can finish our race. And finally, we always need to make sure that as we take these difficult steps, that we look to our Savior Jesus. We keep our eyes on him. In Hebrews chapter 12, he tells the, uh, tells the saints in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's how we can do this. This is how we can be successful. And the great news is we don't even have to do it alone. We have one another. We have all that we need to take these difficult steps but it will require us that we fully give ourselves to God. Let's make sure that we remain with him. Let's make sure that we do not stop. We can't stand face to face and ask Jesus the question the ruler asked him. But we can know exactly how he wants us to live. He can, we can know exactly what he wants us to do. And we can know that there's a great rest promised for us. When I think about Mark chapter 10, I appreciate your attention this morning. You remember how the rich man went away? How was it described that he went away? He went away sorrowful, sad. 
But as I think about that story, I think there was someone else who was sad. Jesus. The text says Jesus loved him. He wanted the best for him. He wasn't trying to hurt him. He wasn't trying to beat him up or anything like that. He loved him, and he said, you can have it. You can take these difficult steps. Follow me. You don't even have to do it alone. Follow me. He went away sad. I believe Jesus was sad as well. And that's something powerful for me to think about and for you to think about as well. Our response to our Savior Some of his disciples, many of his disciples in John 6 and verse 66, they no longer walked with him. They no longer followed him. But Jesus, he loves us, and he always has our best interest in mind, which means that we need to trust in him every step of the way. Let's walk with him, because heaven is going to be amazing. We will be with him one day. If you're ready to make this walk, this commitment, to serve him and to follow him and to put him first. We'd love to study with you and help you to see what you need to do to begin your journey with him. If you're subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as